Welcome back, friends. Here we have part two of Evil for Evil's Sake, the Comstock Mutiny. If you didn't catch part one, you can find a link in the show's description. We cover a lot, but in short, a 20-year-old hellion from Nantucket takes over the whale ship he works on by murdering the officers and terrorizing the crew so he could become the pirate king of indigenous folks who he will make his army on a delightful Pacific island. Oh joy. My name is Jen, and this is Outcasts and Dissidents, New England's History of Misbehavior, where we talk about the crazy true stories, real renegades, and rebellious countercultures of New England's past. We are now past the mutiny and sailing in the Great Pacific at the mercy of the lunatic Samuel Comstock on the prowl for an island to subjugate. It soon became evident that the crew was a bit too chicken shit for the law of brutality Samuel implemented on the ship. Despite knowing that there was the expectation of inflated violence as a consequence of any kind of disharmony. No less, one mild disagreement between Lilliston and Thomas came to a messy head when the men threatened to take knives to each other, but were told to draw arms and have a good old-fashioned shootout before the whole crew with pistols loaded by Samuel, with powder and blanks. Much to Samuel's dark entertainment, the duel began with a full ceremony. Smith said a prayer, and the men were told to, quote, repent for their sins and make peace with God as one would soon be in his presence. What a little sadist. As the men raised their guns, Thomas was shaking so that the gun fell from his hand and exploded when it hit the deck. The powder and rounds, although blank, discharged close enough to Lilliston that they scorched his ankle. Lilliston thoroughly was convinced that he was shot. Samuel leaned into this and had him brought below the deck for surgery and blindfolded so he wouldn't faint at the sight of his own blood. When Samuel pulled up the pant leg, the other men, spectating, became aware of the fact that there was no blood and no bullet. He signaled them to remain quiet about it and began sharpening a knife for amputation just to fuck with Lilliston who was fawning over memories of his mother, as such a crude amputation could prove fatal. As Lilliston resigned himself to the fate's hands and probably Davy Jones' locker, Samuel announced, As wood is very scarce, I do not see how we can afford you a wooden leg. You better keep your present limb until we reach some island where there is plenty of wood. He told him to stand and gave him a literal swift kick in the ass, telling him to get to work and not complain. He then declared to both Lilliston and Thomas that if they got to any more bickering, he would shoot them both, and if there were any further altercations, the gun would be loaded for the next duel, and he may or may not shoot the survivor himself. Very funny, Samuel. Very funny. On February 6th, the globe was nearing an island. It was a hellacious storm, and Samuel was fearful that they would run aground in the torrential rains and wild winds. Fortunately, or unfortunately, no such disaster occurred. By 6 a.m., the storm abated, and by 8.30, the lookout cried, Land ho! And a green island of coconut palms with a glowing sandy white beach appeared on the horizon. The island's inhabitants saw the globe drawing in. They boarded their canoes and paddled out to greet their malignant visitors. Samuel was disappointed by both the people and the island, the people were too dark in skin tone and petite. Yep. And the island bared no indicator of being rich farmland. With the natives, when the natives offered beads and coconuts, Samuel did not engage. On to Marshall's Island nearby. He sent a boat out to investigate, but the residents were rightfully hostile and in fact tried to rob the Globe's crew. They were so unrelenting that the crew fired muskets at the people and struck a man. The locals crossed, the locals ceased in their attempted plunder and made peace offerings of a flag made jacket and beads. One of the men was hit with musket fire from the Globe's crew and probably didn't survive. The other men moved on unapologetically and willing to take the peace offerings.
three days later, they came to the Mulgrave Atoll of Mealy, just shy of midday. Samuel sent Payne to shore to trade, and he came back with women, coconuts, and fish. More women yet came along behind in a canoe. These people were lighter skinned and more robust in build than the previous people they met, and Samuel was hopeful that he would get along with them well. Additionally, the island appeared more lush and suitable for cultivation than the previous. In fact, this island was familiar to Samuel as somewhere he may have come across in a voyage with Captain Chase some years ago. Apparently, this whole asking for women thing is an age-old ruse for testing the good spirits of unknown cultures. If they allow their women to uh, engage with foreign adventurers, then they surely are an agreeable folk, right? It's kind of some gross misogyny, but whatever. So they anchored near to shore, with the island being this bulge steeply sticking up out of deep water. On Sunday, the Lord's Day of Rest, February 15th, they crafted rafts with their provisions and made for landfall by boat. The mutineers had intended to fully unload the ship and burn it, never to leave their new paradise. I can think of a multitude of reasons why that was a bad idea and lacking in forethought, but also the sight of her would alert other sailors, so I guess it was kind of a necessity. They, or rather Samuel, had no intent on leaving. Now, you may recall that Samuel had voiced intent of taking over an island and ruling as a pirate king because he was absolutely delusional. And you may also recall that he was needed as a navigator and perhaps his medical know-how, but they were on land now. Lest the subjugated crew, who were merely allowed to survive the mutiny and subsequent voyage on the commandeered globe, find foothold to overthrow this new King Samuel, he thought it was wise to make goody-good with the locals. If any harm should befall him, he thought, his new islander subjects would defend him and avenge his death. There were far more men who were innocent in the mutiny than there were participants in the mutiny, and indeed, even the mutiny's participants were beginning to turn on him by day two. On that very day, Payne sent word to Samuel that, quote, if he did not act differently with regard to the plunder, plunders, such as making presents to the natives of the officers' fine clothing, etc., he would do no more but instead quit the ship and go on shore. Samuel was pissed. I hope to take the ship, said Samuel, and I have navigated her to this place. I have also done all I could to get the sails and rigging on shore, and now you may do as you please with her. But if any man wants anything of me, I'll take a musket with him. That's what I want, Payne retorted, and I am ready. <laughs> Boys, all of that contention and paranoia is coming to bear here. Now, real quick, shameless plug time. You mean to tell me that Outcasts and Dissidents is on Patreon? Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's right, History Geeks. There is a Patreon page just for you to get ad-free early release and bonus content from this podcast. Head on over to the link in the description to check it out. You can get paid access, you can go free, whatever you would like to do, but just remember that your paid subscription through Patreon helps me to do more research, get more sources, and buy all the books I could ever need so that we can kick ass with these episodes and have high quality content that is educational and engaging. Now back to the show. Armed himself with a cutlass and started mulling. Samuel decided it was now or never. He was no longer needed and in fact was a threat. You couldn't have been on that ship for all of those years and not known he was a problem. And he knew, they knew, 
he deliberately had actually made that very clear. They even ended up with most of the mutineers because he was downright scary to anyone, maybe everyone. These liabilities to his throne had to be dealt with. This would be his first bloody task for the New Island's people. He went angrily to the ship and chopped up the ship's articles. Everyone seemed happy he had turned on their companionship, which just made him angrier, so he went to manipulate the islanders into becoming his army. It was relatively more low risk for them than for the crew, who were greatly outnumbered. When Samuel and dozen, when Samuel and dozens of them walked by Payne's tent around dusk, he feared he wouldn't make it to morning. Payne paddled to the ship and was like, oh shit, you guys, we have to do something. Smith wanted to maintain his middle ground like nope, which I wholeheartedly respect after all that dude went through. The others, however, saw it an opportunity, as Payne did, to end it. They armed themselves to the hilt and made a plan. They would lie in wait surrounding Samuel's tent and ambush anyone who approached approached without giving the sign of a friendly. Nobody approached until dawn when Samuel himself started walking toward the tent at a distance. The men in the middle of swapping ship swapping shifts paddled to land and Oliver offered to be the one to do the deed and three others were also down to help. Interestingly, these other three are nameless, perhaps not taking any major role in the rest of the story. Samuel was lost in tormented thought as he walked, as negotiations with the locals hadn't gone swimmingly. His eyes were on the path and cutlass in hand. He was practically on top of the rogues before he saw them, four muskets pointed right at him. It's funny how tyrants always think it's about their authority or control. So in true narcissist style, Samuel raises his sword at the musketeers and says he won't hurt them. Sammy, honey, I don't think that's a concern right now. Oliver shouted the command and all four of the men blew the demon of a man straight to hell in a hail of musket fire. Nobody foolishly trembled this time. One of the bullets hit him between his lip and nose, passing right through his head, and one of the bullets hit him in the heart, another through and through. Thus ended the life, wrote Hussey and Lay, of perhaps as cruel, bloodthirsty, and vindictive a being as had ever bore the form of humanity. With him down and probably dead on impact, Payne ran down the hill from which his lifeless body had rolled. With an, an axe in hand, he did him just as he had done Captain Worth and Mate Beetle with a blade buried deep, nearly decapitating him. In fact, no one was willing to go near him until they knew he was dead, 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 dead. Like for real dead, not just probably dead. The only way to be sure he wasn't coming back for revenge was for his brains to be in those bushes. The other men were summoned to shore to A. Celebrate and B. Ritualistically bury their evil leader. They fashioned a canvas body bag and dug a five-foot deep grave at what Samuel had intended to be a church site, as so many white colonists do. They wrapped him in an American flag and laid his body to rest as his soul burned in hell. With his body covered, they fired a musket salute and Smith indulged them in Isaiah 14. Everyone but poor George danced on the lunatic's grave, devoting their loyalty to the new command and of the co-conspirators of every coup, Silas Payne. The others were required to participate under threat of death as a traitor, but the men understood the different gravity of this chain of events for George than themselves. George was still effectively an adolescent at only 15. He just wanted an adventure with his brother and hope for his future. His brother had other plans. George witnessed things as a result that no one should have to witness, let alone from a loved one as a child. Now, Oliver and Payne were responsible for this kid, and they were all stranded on this island. 
Nobody knew how to navigate or anything else technical about sailing. They also lacked the charm and people skills to make nicey-nice with the locals. They were pretty much stranded on this island, which could at any moment become hostile territory. So they were basically SOL, and all they could do was repent. William puts this predicament most eloquently, and make of it what you will, because this is an interesting take on the situation, and I just kind of want to share it. He says, He who had amused them like an ignis fatis and led them into the dark abyss of destruction was gone. The eccentric light of his genius was extinguished. The magical charm in which he had bound their senses was broken. The false enthusiasm which he had kindled had sunk with him in his grave like a candle expiring in the socket. They saw that they were naked and that there were no rest for their souls short of eternity. They had served the devil most faithfully, but what was their reward? Foreign relations were going just fine, at least. The locals came to visit the men, bringing fruit and some trade items. And these guys hadn't really engaged with the locals since Samuel had taken the initiative there. It isn't clear if the locals noticed that Samuel was gone, or if maybe they were alarmed by his character and thought perhaps the bunch that kept respectfully to themselves were safer. This meet and greet turned into a party, and all enjoyed a tiddly bit of a holiday after a rough day handling yet another murder. As luck would have it, Payne instructed six men to the globe while Smith and the other innocents were scheming to escape, and the party served as a convenient distraction. The six chosen men were Smith himself, along with poor little George, Kidders 1 and 2, Joe Thomas, and one Anthony Hansen. The other innocents, Cyrus Hussey and William Lay, the survivors who published their accounts, had to slip off at night and join the other innocents on the globe to make their great escape. Thomas and Hansen were suspected sympathizers, innocent until proven guilty, and kept unaware of ease of the scheme as the innocents prepped the globe, mostly Thomas. It was, after all, Thomas's attitude with the captain and subsequent flogging that instigated the whole blowout. The two of them were conveniently allowed to turn in for the evening while the others kept watch. This escape was a complete Hail Mary. All Smith knew was that if they sailed due east, they would hit the broad side of the Americas, where nobody knew. But an uncertain somewhere was better than here. At least they would be able to make it back to New England aboard another ship. It grew dark, and they had the opportunity only now. The moon began to light the sky, but Hussey and Lay had not yet evaded Payne and Oliver's attention. Even innocents and holy men can be traitors for self-preservation. They did not wait around. George cut the cables, and off they sailed, due east, for America. Interestingly, in their own account, Hussey and Lay do not mention this bumble, about 30 minutes later, they say a cry blew out on, on the beach. The ship is gone. The ship is gone. All of them came to the sea, came to sea with much dismay that she was, in fact, gone. And they were officially stranded. The next morning, reality hit and Payne lost his little mind, threatening the lives of the deserters should he see them again. Then the locals show back up like, hey, y'all, your ship went away. So Payne made up some story about how she lost her mooring or whatever, and the wind did its thing, and surely they would be lost adrift forever. Uh, in reality, Payne knew damn well that they had been deserted, and the Globe would likely reach port, perhaps reporting the mutineers to law enforcement. The cascade of possibilities was overwhelming. They continued to get along just okay with the locals for a few days and surrounding islanders were invited, invited to come meet these new men, despite the fact that Samuel set the precedence of sharing and they could answer the question as to where exactly Samuel had gone. They still needed to get away, and the men began creating a Franken-ship of two boats, raising the sides 
of one ship to make her deeper and create a deck more suited to high waves and rough seas than their smaller paddle boats, which were prone to flooding. It was all right skirting these issues with the locals until Payne took a woman as his new lady friend, so he thought. He was not aware that she was married to one of the men of Mealy, despite being from another island. Mealy's social constructs around marriage seemingly offered space for drunken flings with foreign white dudes, which is something accounted for in all kinds of histories during this time of colonial expansion. But when she tried to go home to her husband, she got ugly. He thought she was his forever and ever, forever, ever, and proceeded to chain her to the tent pole, put her in irons, and beat her. Heavy sigh. She was there for several days, apparently, and the men began venturing to visit other nearby islands and exploring opportunities with other women. I would suspect the locals were too leery of these pasty visitors with muskets to attempt a rescue, but he did let her go willingly. The locals were like, that's fucked up, but kind of let it slide. So he and Oliver took off to explore, and this time they each came back with a wife. Life hack ladies, if a man calls you his wife after one date, he's batshit. By this time, the guys had started to let their guards down a little bit around the locals, and no watch was assigned. This woman, too, slipped out into the dark and decided to go home. I can make a lot of jokes about Payne's manhood, but I'll refrain. Also, I suspect that language barriers were a piece of the problem. Now, both Payne and Oliver took to the reconnaissance of Payne's unwilling bride. Armed to the nides with pistols and muskets, they went to reclaim the woman like they were robbing a bank. They fired blanks into a hut as soon as morning rose and chased down the woman. They dragged their captive back to the tent site with obviously no concept of tact, decency, ethics, or PR. When she was like, fuck no, they chained her too in irons to the tent pole and beat her. I just can't even. The locals robbed the men's trunks of a few tools to kick off their aggressions, which makes me think that they were pretty amiable people, not prone to violence. If they didn't return the tools, Payne swore it would be revenge. No, Silas, stealing your tools was revenge. Now stop kidnapping and beating women, please and thank you. However, they needed those tools to refit the boat into a ship if they were ever to leave. When one of the locals came to return a chisel that they had stolen, it was broken, and Payne came unglued. Now, this dude was in irons too. Interestingly, the locals came in and out of the tent, but didn't seem bothered by the man chained up in the corner. The poker face is what it was, not approval. A few designated men were tasked with taking the prisoner to the village and recouping their stolen goods. He led them to a hut to get their hatchet, but he would not give up the thief, so they headed to bring him and the hatchet back to Bain. But lol, the natives had had enough, and hundreds of them ran the men down and began to stone them. They fled, but lost Jones, who was taken down by a flying rock and then beaten the head with another large stone. The three survivors reported to pain the situation, so they armed themselves for an attack, but no attack came. The locals instead sat at all around near the camp like, we need to talk. And reinforcements corralled the camp from all across the atolls. The crew declined to engage the locals, so they began destroying one of those boats that they were building to leave. Payne, instead of reacting violently, approached like, hey, uh, what you doing? And negotiations began and the crew were resigned to forfeiting all of their belongings and assimilating to the island way of life. And they all lived happily ever after. Kidding. I will spare you William's racist-ass New Englander narrative on the following events. Because we were just true heathens, you know that? So the locals began ransacking the camp but a kindly elderly couple that they had previously made good with took Lay aside 
and Hussey was also taken by another family. It seems this may have been because they were much younger than the others who the locals began to attack. We don't know if they tried to retaliate against the locals or if the locals had planned it. Regardless, all of the others were killed with stones, clubs, and spears, even the crewmen from the Sandwich Islands. Lay's captors held him down and made sure he was safe and did not witness the carnage. Lay no less attests that Williston and Brown were slain within six feet of him. Williston had his head beat with a rock and Brown was speared by a woman in her 60s. Yeah, Grandma. Hussey and Lay reunited as the lone survivors at the village after the massacre. They were permitted the next day to bury the bodies of their fallen comrades, returning to a scene of absolute horror. The crew was only there less than two weeks. Two weeks before they had either fled on the ship or were forced to assimilate or gave the locals sufficient cause to murder them. Hussey and Lay lived in fear of death, if not cannibalism, but live they did. In their account, they each offer their separate experiences living on different parts of the atolls, mostly kept separate lest their communication angered the supreme god Anit, who they did likely anger regardless as evidence to the locals by a mysterious disease spread after their integration. We all know how that goes. Nevertheless, they did not kill them and allowed them to meet occasionally and assure one another all was well. It's truly fascinating to read their accounts of this time, and if for no other reason, I would encourage you to check out the link in the description to scribe.com where you can find the whole book. Their individual accounts begin on page 52. You can learn more about the culture of Mealy and the surrounding adults, as well as the relationships the boys formed. Meanwhile, back on the globe, the journey was rough, but surely as soon as Mealy was beyond the horizons, spirits broke joyfully free. Hope was on the new horizon. They didn't have a lot on the ship for provisions, but bread, meat, water, and a few other things sufficient to last just about long enough if they could avoid losing course. The goal was Valparaiso. Four of the men were Nantucketers, and Hansen was from Barnstable, so at least he was a fellow from Massachusetts. Thomas, however, was a Connecticut man, so indeed a New Englander, but he pegged himself a problem pretty quickly. He challenged Smith's authority and tried to rabble-rouse the others against him. Holy shit, some of these dudes just don't know when to sit down and shut up. The men on the voyage spoke regularly of the night of the mutiny, knowing that they were not unlikely to be tried as mutineers for the massacre on the globe. They each recanted their stories, reinforcing their innocence and getting their stories well aligned. They began to wonder, though, if all the time spent ashore before the newcomers came on to replace the deserters, Samuel had been making them aware of the plan and that they signed on as mutineers, unbeknownst to Worth and the others. They knew Coffin was a turncoat after sharing evidence, and Lilliston helped arm them for the mutiny, though he fled for bed before the bloodshed began. With a straight story, they could all be integrated, interrogated honestly, and preserve the innocent while providing an honest testimony against the sick and the cruel. Surely they also wondered how it was going on the island, but it seems they continued to assume all were alive. Little did they know. Three and a half months and 7,500 miles of desolate open ocean later, they spotted land. They celebrated delightfully, and more so because they were remarkably close to their goal of Valparaiso. The hardest part would be to get her into port with a newbie captain and so few for a crew. Fortunately, they spotted the sails of a French vessel. A Chilean vessel? Uh, counts very. Nonetheless, they hailed her, whoever she was, and were able to get help from the captain and crew getting the globe safely into the harbor. They were, however, turned into the American consul by Valparaiso's port authorities. They were by whatever miracle in luck because this man, Michael Hogan, was not the usual hard-ass, no-exceptions iron fist. 
he knew damn well that American captains could be an absolute nightmare. And when men deserted or mutinied, it was usually because they were driven to virtual insanity by malicious, unjust, and inhumane treatment. Hogan actually stated so in his letter regarding the incident to President John Quincy Adams, or sorry, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. Not president yet. With no assumption the mutiny was unjustified, he was unusually just unbiased and investigator of the incident. There is a transcript available of Smith's questioning and Hussey and Lay's account, and it is one of the most reasonable questionings I've ever read. Not a shred of accusation. God bless the level head. It was nevertheless about a month of detainment and questioning for the men. They all agreed on everything, except for Thomas, who lied and denied to defend himself in spite of the other men informing the consul of the truth. He even denied being flogged. A bastard. At last, he caved over the flogging with enough prodding by Hogan. He admitted that Worth threatened him with a cat and nine, and that he told Worth that if he did it, it would be a dead blow to him. Oh, done, son. The confessions roll from there. Hogan deliberated for a few days before Thomas was found guilty and bound in irons. The other five were let go and allowed to be free about Valparaiso, waiting arraignment, arrangements to get them home, where they must agree to participate in any resulting trials regarding the mutiny. I can feel the relief through time and space. The Globe eventually was given to one Captain King, who was made responsible for getting her and the men back to Nantucket. Leaving in July of 1824, it was nearly December before she finally made her home port, rode hard, and put away wet. The magistrate there agreed with Hogan's deduction of events and let go the five innocents and held Thomas for a trial in Boston. He was later amazingly acquitted. By this time, the government had commissioned the schooner Dolphin under the command of a lieutenant, Mad Jack Percival, to find the survivors on Mealy. On December 23, 1825, almost two years after the globe first reached Mealy, the Dolphin dropped anchor off the island. The locals were not happy to see another ship, and it fairly well went bananas. Swimming out, throwing the crew overboard like not again. One man actually approached the lieutenant in English. He probably learned from the boys, and Percival was not at all sure that it wasn't one of the mutineers, since the state of the survivors was not known. Nevertheless, the rescuers jumped ship and ran, or ran ashore. Lay ran to the lieutenant, speechless, and began ranting to him with his local quote-unquote family in hot pursuit. But they were halted by gunpoint. Hussey, on a nearby island, was next to be found, rescued, and put aboard the dolphin. Instead of leaving right off, they stayed for a few days and met with the local chiefs, discussing their violent and racist-ass views of how international relations ought to look, subservience or death. Before leaving, they exhumed the body of Samuel, taking his depraved little skull and his cutlass back with them. Reportedly, they were given to a museum in New York City, but have since been lost, as far as I know. It was, dear friends, another year and a half of adventure aboard the Dolphin before the boys made it home, landing on April 22nd, 1827. So, what came of these survivors? Well, it looks like Cyrus Hussey died a couple of years later in February of 1829 at sea on another whaling voyage. William Lay, however, seems to have lived to be 90 in Connecticut as a well-off farmer and a later fish dealer with a wife and children. I can't find burials for either of them. Hussey was almost definitely buried at sea, and I wouldn't be surprised if Lay is in a family plot tucked into the New England overgrowth or under a parking lot somewhere. Joseph Thomas proved elusive with such a common name, and it seems he just kind of disappeared after his trial as a co-conspirator in the mutiny. Anthony Hansen or Hinson, depending on what records you're finding, uh, or what testimonies also proved difficult to find. Gilbert Smith lived to be into his 70s as a farmer and a deacon, never lost his love for God even after all that. He was married even before the Globe shit show and had many children. 
He seems to be buried in Sheffield, Mass., but Mutiny on the Globe says that he lived in France for a time and did work on other whalers, eventually as a captain. George Comstock lived just about all over the place, from Nantucket, New York, to New Orleans, and lastly in California as a miner. He married his cousin Lucy, then a British woman, in New Orleans. At one point, he must have corresponded with Lay and Hussey because they offer a short testimony of his in their book, and he surely spoke to William about it for William to have the details that he had. George died in 1855 at just 47. His body was moved from its original plot and is now in Colma, California. Stephen Kidder actually did another voyage on the globe and several other ships before he became a farmer. He also had a family and lived to be in his 60s. He is buried in Edgerton, Mass., but his brother Peter died a couple of years after getting home from hell, drowning in the ocean on the sloop Chancellor. Now, I wasn't planning on making this podcast a testament to why human beings do not belong in the ocean, but it seems to be shaking out that way, friends. Don't go to sea, be a farmer. And so we commence part two of this two-part series, Evil for Evil's Sake, The Comstock Mutiny, a line taken from William's book about Samuel's life and the entire debacle. Down under, you will find an annotated bibliography of sources used for research in the making of this episode. Until next time, I will be wishing you fair winds, following seas, and better luck than the crew on the globe.